John Straw. This is a summary of a speech that I give called Disruption in Three Dimensions and will take approximately six minutes. A bit of background on me. Um, I'm a four exit digital entrepreneur over the past 20 years, a venture investor. I'm an author of a book called I Disrupted about disruptive technology from a couple of years ago. I led the digital transformation at Thomas Cook uh, make the occasional contribution to The Economist, especially around artificial intelligence, and have been delighted to become a senior advisor to McKinsey uh, for the past couple of years. So before I set up and talk a bit about technology, I want to, I want to set this thing up and frame it around a vision, an aspiration, an obsession, and a change in the world order. So let me just come on to a vision. Many of you have heard of the Dollar Shave Club. Uh, the story is fantastic. Uh, it was a entrepreneur that wanted to turn over the men's razor market and turn it into a subscription-based pricing model. And rather than just simply set up a business with a supply chain and a product, etc., what he did was he borrowed $5,000 from his parents, built a YouTube video in order to gauge demand, and then built a business from there. So let me just show you a first couple of minutes of this video. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. You get the idea. So four years later, he'd become so disruptive because he'd actually gone and raised a lot of venture capital off the back of what was half a million page views, apparently, in the first four weeks, and is now up to 23 million page uh, uh, views on uh, YouTube. So four years later, we know he's become disruptive because Gillette sued him for patent infringement very shortly afterwards, Unilever bought him for $1 billion. So that's the vision side of it. Let me just talk a little bit about an aspiration. And I call this an aspiration for enterprises because it's Elon Musk again. And in fact, what happened was, was that Elon Musk got a product suggestion on Twitter and Tesla implemented it six days later. And I think that's aspirational for most uh, enterprises. So in fact, actually, one of the things that actually generated a valuation which makes him the most valuable car company in America is, in fact, I don't think the cars. I think it's the business model and the technology that sits behind it. And he's moved very firmly into the energy space. And that's how I think that he's got his valuation. And in fact, if you can't beat them, join them. Mercedes very recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, announced that they were also moving into the home uh, battery storage business. So then you've got an obsession. And this was um, essentially a keyword cloud pulled out of uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, note to shareholders uh, of a couple of months ago. And I think this, is, this nails why Amazon is just such a successful organization. As you can see, customer references in the 2016 shareholder letter, 19, product, 6, obsess, 4, failure, 2, and just between share owner and shareholder, just one particular mention. It's very obvious where he puts his emphasis. And in fact, that has led to a change in the world order because in the past five years, we've seen the whole oil landscape change. So in 2011, four of the five top companies in the world were petrochemicals. In 2016, five of the top companies in the world, you might describe them as being technology companies. I don't think they are technology companies anymore. I think that they are platform businesses, hence their valuations. So let me come on to um, uh, the main themes of the talk. So the, this is what I call the five pillars of technology disruption. And I, I talk about them and show lots of examples and explain them. So artificial intelligence and big data, 3D printing and material science, advanced robotics, virtual reality, and the Internet of Things, of course. But if you think back to the boom of 2000 and the bust of 2000, this was all about technology without business models and business models enablers. And now I think that we're looking at a whole layer of enablement that goes on top of that. So firstly, we have the availability of um, web services, Amazon Cloud. We don't have to start going out and spending huge amounts of money on hardware to fund or to start our, um, our businesses. The availability of much cheaper, faster computing. Uh, in the book, we did a calculation that if cars had increased their performance at the same rate as uh, computers had since 1965, they would now be capable of 1 million miles per second. Then there's the API um, uh, uh, business. I, and, and this is, I am hugely enthused by this business because it just opens up so many opportunities. And I'm going to give you an example of just one of those in a second. Then there's open source. Um, a, a lot of the big players, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, are now actually turning their software code over to the open source community because the real value is in the data. 
wireless transmitters, uh, wireless uh, uh, signaling equipment, miniaturization. This one's actually, in fact, an edible one. Um, and that really is providing the foundation of the Internet of Things. Freemium business models. And then, of course, blockchain. But finally, and I think this is really important, is it's the availability of capital. And this is, in fact, crowdfunded capital right from the start of, of many businesses, many startups. That's how they actually generate their capital. But the real killer here is combining the business model enablers with the disruptive technology. And the killer is in the adoption curve. And I think that's what, we're, what we've been missing prior to this point. And in fact, if you looked at Kodak, it took Kodak about three or four years to actually get disrupted. Now, adoption, now a disruption can happen literally in a software update. And I'm going to give you an example of that. The API um, economy combined with um, software updates combined with adoption curves. So uh, about six months ago, uh, Uber turned its application programming interface over to the commercial community. And this basically means that uh, people like United Airlines could interface uh, their computer systems with the Uber system. And the first example I saw of this was fantastic. I was uh, booking a hotel uh, last Christmas and I noticed on the very excellent uh, Hilton app that all of a sudden a new button had appeared and rides by Uber. So I pressed the button to discover that Uber via APIs was looking at my diary to find out where I was on the day of the uh, booking. It obviously knew where the Hilton was. It then also looked at my diary to actually find out when I finished with the Hilton stay and where I was going to go after next. So one single click, all of a sudden, I'm fully integrated and the whole system looks out of it. It completely takes all the pain out of the system. And it's great because Uber gets distribution Hilton gets a small commission, but the really interesting part of this is that Hilton updated this app by, I think it was 6 million in something like 24 hours. So you get those combinations of disruptive technology, disruptive business model enablers, and then all of a sudden the adoption curve. And then finally, I, I'm also um, pretty enthused by the chatbot economy. Um, and this has been pushed very heavily by Facebook, Google, and now very recently Apple. And what I'm about to show you is a phenomenally successful business that was a, a, a chatbot that was uh, written to help uh, people with parking tickets in New York and London. And in fact, actually had, uh, had solved 150,000 issues with parking tickets uh, over a very short period of time. It's recently been funded with a bunch of venture capital. And I just wanted to show you the video. So that was a summary of what is an hour speech. Um, optionally, we can attach on to that, uh, proving uh, pretty popular with some of our clients, and that was what I described as being an entrepreneur's day, where we divide clients into teams and we get them to design their own startups. Uh, and that has actually had a, a fantastic effect on a number of uh, clients. So, johnstraw at gmail.com or my Twitter handle is johnstraw. Thank you.